uh, Margazata, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> I think we have, yeah, we have enough people here. We can start. Okay. Dobry večer. Від імені спільноти Флорецького міжнародного університету в Майамі, доктор Хілари Ландор, виконавчий директор Офісу глобальних навчальних ініціатив, та я, Малгожата Дуригін, маємо честь привітати сьогодні доктора Василя Бялика, завідувача кафедри комунікативної лінгвістики та перекладу, та доктор Оксану Петренко, доцента цієї ж кафедри, Ich kolej ta studentów z Czerniweckiego Nacjonalnego Uniwersytetu im. Jurija Fetkowicza, a także hostej z Czerniwcy w Miami i inne tylko. My chcieli podziękować uczestnikom z Ukrainy za to, że wy w taki nieprosty czas przyjęli nasze zaproszenia do wspólnego dialogu. My wdzięczni wam za waszą chorobność, uborodbi za nasze wspólne wartości, zokrema za swobodę i demokrację, jaki nie dani nam raz i na zawsze. Razem z wami wiry Moszo, jak każe wasz lider, że ja może śmierć, a światło temrawu. Dziękuję, thank you. Thank you, Marzata. Hello, good evening. I'd like to welcome our FIU students, faculty, administrators and friends to one of our most noteworthy events. Today we'll be speaking live with faculty and students who represent our counterparts at Chernivtsi National University in Chernivtsi, Ukraine. On behalf of the whole FIU community, I'd like to express our profound appreciation and gratitude to our guests for their willingness and efforts to speak to us directly about their situation in Ukraine today. In this time, it's critical for all of us to hear directly from those who bear witness to history. Your direct testimony will help us build support for your individual and your collective well-being. Democracy exists as a commitment or not at all. In taking the risks you do on a daily basis, you are making possible the continuation of democracy for all of us. Please know that we're in awe at your strength of mind, body, heart, and soul as you continue your courageous fight for democracy, for you, for us, and for the world. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Shlomi Dinar, Interim Dean of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at FIU. Dr. Dinar is also the faculty director for the Master of Arts in Global Affairs program. His research interests lie at the intersection of international environmental politics, security and negotiation, all essential interconnected areas of international relations. Thank you for being us, with us, Dean Dinar. We're happy that you're here. Thank you so much, Dr. Landorf, uh, for the introduction and, and more importantly, for organizing this event for our students and inviting me to say a few words to our guests from Ukraine. I'm honored to be here with all of you, though I wish the circumstances were much different. To our friends from Ukraine, students and faculty members who join us from their university, please know we are humbled by your willingness to be with us today and to share your stories. You are witnesses to history, a terrible history, and we are so proud of you for your bravery and your tenacity in the face of such difficulties. Since the Russian invasion began in February, we in the United States have watched this war unfold with great sadness. Many of our faculty and some students as well have experience in the region, traveling or studying, doing research or simply living, and it is with tremendous concern and that we watch your struggle from afar. Please know that your fight for democracy is the world's fight. We support you and we are with you in spirit, if not on the ground. At the Green School, we are committed to fostering a greater understanding of global issues and the common struggles of our one human family. Through our Voslov Havel program, for human rights and diplomacy, we are especially concerned about the struggle for democracy around the globe 
and we have hosted many great leaders from Eastern Europe and other regions to inspire and educate our students so that they understand the privilege and responsibility of freedom and democracy. And that as our future global leaders, they will be able to make the best, most informed decisions. Earlier this year, we hosted Yuri Sergeyev, the former Ukraine amb Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations. And he shared with our students his views on the Ukrainian patriots, whose principal goal is to protect and further build on independent, democratic, and prosperous Ukraine. That is what we wish for you as well. I applaud you for joining this conversation with our students and for sharing your insight on the situation in Ukraine and what we in the United States may be able to do to help. Thank you again for being here. We send you our heartfelt wishes for peace, for safety, and the safety of your friends and family. Thank you, and Slava Ukraine. <laughs> <clears throat> We're also honored to have with us two distinguished faculty, many distinguished faculty members, but two I'm going to introduce uh, from Trinity National University. That's Drs. Vasil Bialik and Oksana Petrenko. Dr. Bialik is a full professor and chair of the Department of Communicative Linguistics and Translation, specializing in the theory and history of translation. And Dr. Petrenko is an associate professor of second and foreign language linguistics and linguistics research. Thank you so much for joining us and for bringing your students into this vital conversation. So we'll first hear a few words from Dr. Bialik and then Dr. Petrenko. Thank you, Dr. Landoff. Uh, I have a privilege and honor to say some welcome words this evening at this meeting. And I do hope that this is not one day event or one time meeting, as I do believe that we'll have to conduct such meetings frequently on a, on a, pro, uh, on a, on a, on a continual basis, so to say, every time. I think that uh, I would like also to express uh, my deep gratitude to Dr. Uh, Landov and Ms. Malgajata uh, Durigin, as well as Michelle Zalwit. And uh, I really, really greatly appreciate your assistance and support with the Ukraine. And uh, you see, we, you make us stronger because we believe that we can defend this values that you share, that we share together. And here among the students, who are mostly from Ukraine. Recording in progress. And we are really impressed uh, for, for such occasion that American friends can try to, to be interested in our situation. You see, it is really crucial and very difficult period for Ukraine. And our struggle for our freedom and for our um, independence uh, is very hard, but I hope and I know that we, we, we will win, you see? 
because the price is very, very high for everybody of us, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole world. And I hope so that it is not the, the first and the last one meeting. Maybe in future, when, when we win, after our victory, we will see you in our country, in our city, and we will show you the, the beautiful, the beautiful city. Perfectly, for sure, beautiful city and beautiful university. And I hope so that our students from both sides, from the United States of America and from Ukraine, they will be very great friends, big friends, something like we are, I, I think nowadays we are something like relatives because you are so very, very, very close to us. You try to understand our, maybe our problems and you try to understand our life. And um, maybe you, 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 you can be in touch with this. You, you hear the signals of alert and it is something like symbolic, you see? It's very symbolic. You feel what does it mean? What does it mean for us? And what does it mean for, for the whole world? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this meeting. And I hope so that it will be in future, not speaking only about the war and the life in war, but also about the, about the peace and how to renovate this country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petrenko. Um, now um, we're going to go and have the students have a chance to um, express their views. Um, and we'll go through a few questions uh, for the students. We, um, you can put your answers in chat or we, um, unmute your speaker and we'd love to hear from you. First question for you. Just if you would, please describe your daily life now during the war. <clears throat> if you would describe, um, we'd like to know what you do in your daily life during the war. What's your daily life like? <clears throat> okay, may I start, please? Please. Yeah. So I wake up early in the morning with the thought of uh, the upcoming day and the tasks that I might tackle and the possibilities of uh, me improving the situation in this country. Also, of course, we all of us are trying to study and to achieve some results and to uh, try to uh, followed the routine. However, with the constant bombing, with the constant air raid uh, alarm, it is pretty hard to not to be stressed and not to think about different uh, uh, aspects of your life and not to ask yourself a thought-provoking questions. However, I'm pretty sure that all of us are trying to uh, to pretend like everything is fine and that we try to uh, be strong, be courageous and always to uh, follow our, uh, our day through to uh, we are trying to uh, do everything possible, everything in our power to uh, make our families proud, to make everyone proud and always be happy because that's what our soldiers are fighting for. They are fighting for us to be happy, to be free, to enjoy the freedom and peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Dina. <clears throat> Let's hear from another student. I would like to say some words. Um, every day is, you know, every day includes this constant fear of unknown because especially when you hear air raid sirens, you just, you need to protect yourself, but you really don't know how. And you are just thinking about all those people who are fighting for our freedom. And for those people who are, who are, you know, hearing those air raid sirens, 
every single day and throughout whole day and you just feel very bad you feel horrified and i am reading the news what is happening and uh, i'm just i just get overwhelmed i uh, can start crying just because i feel like it's it's so bad because our country has always been fighting for freedom and right now we need we just we cannot give up we need to win and i know this that this will happen one day it's just i need to keep continue living and to protect myself to protect my relatives and just to help the soldiers to fight for ukraine mm -hmm. thank you anastasia and thank you for being so open about your feelings <clears throat> May I add something? Please. So hello to everyone. I'm really uh, happy to hear the words you said today. Uh, and to, to talk about the day, I must say that probably nowadays everyone is like maybe on the 24th of February, but we are not afraid anymore, I think, because uh, all of us are expecting the victory and I think that it will soon come. I just uh, must say that uh, the only thing is like to you to know that like probably uh, there is no day for any of the Ukrainians to uh, spend like without the help to the, to the military, to the IDPs probably. And uh, uh, that's how like, I'm really proud to be Ukrainian because of that, because there is no day without support like for, for those who are in need and for the our military to finish this war. So that, that's it, I would say. Thank you, Maxime. We appreciate those words. <clears throat> May I add, please? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, so to be honest, at the beginning of the war, I also had the same feelings when the uh, war in Syria began. I was born in Damascus and lived there uh, until I was nine years old. Um, my family and I had to leave because life there was unbearable. Uncertainty, fear, um, sadness, and anger, the, uh, these are feelings that do not leave me, honestly. Um, but thanks God, my whole family is alive. Uh, but my uncle is a military man. So he has been serving and protecting Ukraine since 2014. So on February 21st, of course, he went to, to defend his homeland uh, and he was um, in Kiev and he uh, miraculously survived. Uh, my mom uh, most often um, can, cannot call him because often um, there is not connection. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't know where he is. Uh, he has not responded for a month. Uh, so we're trying to call him uh, and uh, we try to support each other. So this is uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I might add. Uh, at the beginning of the war, we pretty could say that we all experienced fear, but we knew that we had to adapt to it all, to the new situation that, faced, that we have faced now, and quickly started volunteering, I think. And when you hear some people that come here to our city, from the uh, all the cities that suffered from the aggression that's been bombarded, all the atrocities that have been committed against the Ukrainian people. It's nothing like some news when you experience it firsthand. It's very unfortunate that it happened to, to them and we're trying our best. When you try your best to help them to find shelter for these people. It gives at least some hope that we, as Ukrainians, can be united and we can help each other to endure and face the aggression of the Russia. Thank you, Pavel. Um, we're gonna go on to the next question. Um, what do you want us to know about the situation in Ukraine?
What would you like us to know about the war? <clears throat> May I start, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so first of all, I'd like to emphasize the fact that this war has started uh, basically 10 years ago in 2014. And I actually first handedly uh, felt this pressure as I uh, lived in Eastern Ukraine in Donbass region. And I knew what fear was uh, when I was 12 years old. So I felt that pressure and uh, I knew that um, Russians were not going to save us. And even uh, at that time, they committed a lot of atrocities that were not precedented and were not prosecuted and punished. Uh, the world led Putin and uh, his uh, uh, and his uh, minions, so to speak, uh, get away, and he was unpunished. He basically uh, took part of our territory, uh, the territory that uh, my family and I used to visit a lot. We used to spend a lot of time there and enjoy beautiful local sightseeing. But because of this uh, proxy war and this hybrid war, we had to flee. We had to unfortunately abstain uh, from all of the luxuries that we used to have. And that was an unfortunate page in our history. And now, uh, right now, Russia is committing a lot of crimes and pinning them to uh, to neo-Nazis that don't even exist. It's a myth, a common misconception that they, uh, that they are using to weaponize their propaganda and to push their agenda of uh, fighting against terrorism where, where they are the real terrorists and they have to be uh, punished for that. And the whole world's community uh, should gather and should uh, tell them that they have to be stopped and they uh, should be uh, put at their place. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, other responses? What do you want us to know about what's going on? May I? Maxime. So as, uh, as uh, since the war began, I was like cooperating with some big organizations, probably as you heard for the reason, uh, I have faced with a lot of IDPs like in Trinity. And unfortunately, or I don't know, it may be fortunately, I heard a lot of stories like of not the best, like, uh, I don't know, attitude to them. And I must say like that a lot of people, it's like as the process started, it's a long uh, propaganda, like which started far, far away in the past, I must say. Because a lot of people, which are maybe much older than, I don't know, like the shits, yeah, I'd say are really old people, they believe that uh, it's Ukrainian attacking the, the Russia until they came right here, like to the Western Ukraine, and they even didn't believe that probably uh, such great people living here, because they always believe that the uh, people like Banderity and something like that, uh, like I know, are here. But uh, it's not, uh, I must say that this is like was planned not like only this year or not maybe for the last few years. I think it has been planning for a long, long time. And unfortunately, I must say that every person is affected by this war because it doesn't matter. It, are you a soldier or are you here in the safe maybe places in Ukraine where you can support only by volunteering and maybe making donations? And also, I'm afraid that uh, you probably uh, don't even imagine how worse maybe it is because of the civilians are killed. Because you probably saw the pictures from Bucha, from Irpin, but I'm afraid, for example, in the Western and the South Ukraine, probably like Mariupol or something like this, there's much worse. And uh, I'm really, when it will be occupied, I think uh, the picture will be really, uh, I don't know, scary. Uh, like, uh, but uh, I think that not a lot of people even imagine how bad is it. So probably uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Maxime. <clears throat> May I please? Yes, please, Nora. So I want to focus your attention on small cities and villages on the front line, which is under fire every day and night. The media doesn't give them much attention, but there are still people who can't just leave their houses for whatever reasons, and hundreds of families uh, who lost their homes. 
Uh, Russia keeps destroying those areas without any military benefit, just pure terror. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, uh, just pure terror against civilians. Um, also, I want to mention humanitarian uh, problems in occupied territories because hospitals are used for Russian soldiers and rejected for civilians. So it's um, almost Im impossible to get help in case of any emergency. Um, Russia rejects any humanitarian aid from Ukraine to that territory and doesn't support it in any way to civilians. So the only way to help people there is by spreading information, please, and mentioning the International Red Cross or um, other organization about humanitarian crisis there in all territories that were liberated by the Ukrainian army or military detects new crimes like Bucha. Uh, so we're dealing with cruel country that deliberately kills innocent people in all ways and only together we can stop them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nora, that's very helpful for us. Um, <clears throat> if we can, uh, that's a good segue to the next question. And I encourage those of you who haven't spoken yet to, um, to give your, to, to make your voice heard. Um, so what can we do to, if anything, what can we do to help you and your family and friends or to help Ukraine? <clears throat> if I may. Please. Uh, I have no unstable network, so you can hear me badly. Uh, so I no, we can hear you that. fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that, that, that's great. Uh, I can say about my family personally, now my dad is at war, but we are trying our best to help him and uh, to help uh, military in our country i would rather say that you can help the whole ukraine and ukrainian people by spreading the message as Nura just said you can spread the world on social social media to your friends family and anyone you can if you have a possibility if you have money you also can donate to various uh, charitable organizations to, to support ukraine and if you don't have money or you don't have a possibility to do that, you can really help us to bring it to the people's attention to make uh, more and more people know about it. I will be really helpful for that. Thank you, Basim. <clears throat> Tatiana Anastasia. <clears throat> I would like uh, to add uh, so uh, we know that a range of countries have committed uh, billions of dollars as an aid for Ukraine, but uh, yet the demand of security assistance is still high because uh, we have been fighting for more than eight months. And um, uh, also the main idea uh, is uh, to remember about Ukraine, about the war that it's still going on. and. Um, um, the best that we, that, um, we all can do is uh, uh, to go on demonstrations and uh, to attract public attention to the fact that the war uh, is still uh, going on. And uh, <clears throat> even uh, wearing like a jacket with the Ukrainian flag on, uh, um, I guess uh, that also will work. And um, the worst, uh, the worst that can happen is to, uh, like, to get used to such situation and do nothing. Uh, so, uh, like, it's up to everyone, and uh, everyone has to do uh, that is uh, that um, people can do. Thank you, Tatiana. <clears throat> Okay, so we had a question that came in and we'll share other questions later, but since this question is so related to the question just asked about what we can do, I'd like to ask this now. How can we help and support the efforts to preserve uh, Ukrainian culture? So first of all, you can uh, always uh, speak out on this topic 
as uh, uh, many people even uh, nowadays confuse Russian and Ukrainian culture, which uh, is unacceptable and they are absolutely different. And that was the Soviet Union's policy before to incorporate all the cultures uh, and create one uh, culture that would erase the nationality, the uh, the culture, the, the language. Uh, and now we are still trying to restore everything that was lost. Like even uh, our letters were taken out from our alphabet and now we are restoring everything. So please spread the word. Please uh, tell everyone about Ukrainian culture, how uh, it's... Uh, uh, diverse, how it has a lot of sides to it, and how it can uh, it can uh, astonish everyone and just stun everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Danilo. Very good advice. Are there responses here? How can we spread the word about um, or help and support? efforts to preserve Ukrainian culture and we'll mix that about what do you what do you want us to know about Ukraine? Simply just one word only. I want to say okay. that this is the war not only between two countries, but but between two cultures, completely different, between two mentalities, completely different. And uh, how all these Ukrainian cultures is so it's like two millennium or something like that, you see. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I, th I suppose probably the students will just pick up this topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bianca. <laughs> <clears throat> May I add something, like in this case? Yes, please, Maxim. I also know that uh, there are a lot of Ukrainian singers and bands, like which are participating all around the world. So um, I don't know, you probably all of us heard a lot of Ukrainian songs, like the one, for example, which one's uh, Eurovision or something like that. I strongly recommend you to visit this concert just to feel like this Ukrainian language, just to feel this Ukrainian culture. And also what is else, as Vasil Medvedev said, it's like completely true that we are not the same as Russians. Don't, don't mess with that, like, because it's two different cultures. And if you check what's going on in the uh, south of Ukraine, where Ukrainian culture is trying to be completely demolished and completely destroyed, so you will find out how important it is like just to keep it, because Ukrainian culture has been uh, like I know, trying to be destroyed for a long, long time because uh, Russians were always against that. Uh, it's like I don't know since the beginning of the existing of USSR and like until nowadays. So you just have to know that's a little bit difference between Ukrainian and Russian. So that that's mm -hmm. what you need to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, um, and would anyone like to, to to elaborate on this, the differences or something that we can hold on to about Ukrainian culture? <clears throat> May I just add, um, and the best way, in my opinion, the best way to raise awareness is to talk with natives, like Ukrainians in this case. Uh, I was a former exchange student and I had a chance to study in the US uh, in 2013-14. And the program that gave me the chance is called FLEX. It was established by the US uh, Department of State after the Cold War and when uh, the Soviet Union broke. And this program, like the main aim is to find this mutual understanding be between America and the countries that um, were the part uh, of the Soviet Union at that time. And I had a chance to study in my uh, high school in the States. It was uh, a school in Houston district. And the thing I noticed uh, that a lot of Americans at that time in 2013 had no idea that Ukraine was a separate country. Uh, we all know in Ukraine that we say just Ukraine, but uh, uh, my a lot of my teachers said they're Ukraine because they wanted to add this article that we belong to Russia somehow. And uh, this exchange here has given a lot uh, to me and to my understanding of American culture. But on the other hand, I've developed long lasting friendship with my American friends, uh, with my former teachers and uh, the support and the kind words that I received on the 24th of February um, were beyond description. And uh, my um, students uh, at my high school remembered me and they contacted me with their kind wishes and prayers. And 
uh, I have a feeling that they remember me and they remember Ukrainian culture by this. Mm -hmm. And this dialogue is just perfect between our students and the students of your university, because they will know more about uh, our um, traditions here, about our customs. And I'm sure that it will encourage this long lasting relationship in the future. And we can do like, uh, we can't make it even better if we uh, just continue working and cooperating. It will be the best choice in this case. Thank you, Dr. Senchek. And I'm sure that what you say is true, that you brought a lot of knowledge and awareness of Ukraine to your U.S. peers when you were there. If I may, I would like to dwell mm -hmm. on this topic a bit more. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot, uh, I guess that a lot of uh, Americans right now are not uh, aware no, part of the Western world is not aware that uh, Ukraine and uh, all of the post-Soviet countries are suffering from, if I may to say so, post-colonial syndrome. Because not everyone is seeing Russia as a colonial state, colonial empire, but it, actually it was. It just because um, their colonies were not situated on a different continent, most of the people still do not recognize that Russia is a colonial state and needs to be decolonized, not only about uh, 15 republics that used to con uh, create a Soviet Union, but also there are a lot of uh, mi minority nations in Russia that are still being oppressed and uh, they are banned for speaking their language as we used to when we were in the Soviet Union. Yeah, For example, I can speak from my personal experience. My uh, uh, great-grandfather was a miller and he had quite successful business in uh, late Tsarist times. But after that, when the Red Army came, they named him Kurkul. They uh, confiscated all of his uh, belongings and his mill. And after that, my family lost everything and couldn't recover for like 50 years. And I guess uh, this experience was shared by like millions of my compatriots in Ukraine and in other uh, republics. That is why a lot of people right now who used to be part of Soviet Union are so negative about it and about Russia. Because Russians were the uh, like the main uh, beneficiary of this uh, of these resources that were uh, dragged out from the colonial states like Ukraine or Baltic states or Poland. That's why they uh, never had so, so shortages. That's why they not understand what a Holodomor was. When millions of Ukrainians starved to death because all of the grain was confiscated, Russia in that time uh, had a rich life and they used this grain to pay, uh, to, uh, to pay for a lot of equipment to industrialize like core of Russia. Right now, uh, in those cities like Chirabings or uh, others where Russian tanks are being uh, created to go to war to Ukraine once more. So we need to know, uh, we need to spread this information that a lot of, of the people in the West don't know yet that Russia is also a country that needs to be decolonized. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Very important. <clears throat> Um, we have one more question, um, predetermined questions, and then there are several questions coming in from um, faculty and students and staff at um, FIU. And that question is, um, what do you want us to know that hasn't been reported in the media um, that you feel like that needs to be, that we need to hear that, ha that we wouldn't have heard in the media? <clears throat> If I might try. Mm -hmm. uh, so, regarding the, maybe the, the occupied territories that are uh, right now under the Ukrainian control, but still, um, my father, who is a volunteer, went recently to Kharkiv region, and he himself witnessed what destruction and what atrocities have been committed there. And it is said in the media, like um, when specifically has uh, what specifically has been hit. There uh, are shown the examples of um, who has suffered. But when you actually see it for yourself, you understand that people still live there and they still are in fear of the uh, occup occupants, and they do not get all the resources that they need. And when you ch see it by yourself, you just realize that the civilization has almost stopped there. No mm -hmm. light, nothing, and you are trying our best to help these people 
to stop this. The, it's not even the Nazification, as the Russia told, is the civilization. It's almost everything has been stripped out of this region. So I, I think that has to be specified more that people need still need our help now, now not more more than ever. So we could to recover. Thank you, Pablo. <clears throat> May I also add something? Please. Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut in. No, <laughs> um, I wanted to tell from my personal experience because my grandpa always told me how, like in Ru uh, in Russian media, they tend to tell that uh, the Russians were oppressed, especially uh, in the in the east of Ukraine. But that's not completely true because my grandpa told me that in Moscow when. Uh, he used to work there. Uh, he was treated unfairly. Uh, whereas in Ukraine, when uh, some people from Siberia or uh, from other regions migrated to Ukraine, they were offered uh, facilities to live in. They were offered jobs and they were uh, paid equally to Ukrainians. So this narrative that uh, Kremlin is pushing about inequality or oppression was completely untrue. And actually their actions made the situation even more deteriorating right now. Thank you, Tinira. If I may. Please. Uh, now, uh, I don't know if you already know this information, but because of the, uh, because of the shelling over the past few weeks, uh, our country is uh, like, we have uh, frequent power outrages because uh, many power grids have been badly damaged. And uh, for example, my mother now, uh, she's living in, in this town in Chernivtsi. However, she's living like in, uh, in the region, in the countryside, and uh, she has no source of electricity from the early morning till now and uh, uh, even though we are calling this all war uh, we uh, we are reading many stories for example i have read many stories from twitter uh, from ukrainian friends and from people that i know about all the terrible things that are happening there and all the terrible things that the Russian sh soldiers are doing to our fellow Ukrainians, to girls. And uh, I would rather call it not a war, but rather a genocide more. Yes, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> sorry for interrupting, but I want to add something. First of all, for your mediate, you must maybe the main thing that nowadays we have the genocide of Ukrainian nation, you see, genocide, because a lot of crimes, a lot, a lot of violation, you see, and now we have air raid terror all over through the whole country, because we live are always under the alert, you see, and you must know it. You must know it because our price is very high, but it is very difficult to break us. It's very difficult, but never, nevertheless, we have nowadays we must speak about the genocide. The first thing is, yes. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kuchenko. <clears throat> <laughs> Mm 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's so important for us to hear. <clears throat> um, if I may just add, like uh, we um, have enough press coverage, I suppose, about the uh, the war, missile strikes, air raids. But I just want to add that um, social problems are on the rise, and honestly, I'm scared of planning my future and starting like uh, a family because I don't know what to expect next. Uh, our salaries decrease. We a lot of people lose homes. Uh, a lot of homeless people nowadays who depend on volunteers and the humanitarian aid that countries ship us and supply us with, and. Um, uh, like the people say that we should pre um, prepare for the um, most severe uh, winter. And I believe it's going to be true because we now experience power cuts. And honestly, uh, if I talk about myself, if I have no electricity at home, it means I'm uh, hopeless. I have no light. I have no uh, water. I have no gas. So um, I know that my grandma has the same situation. She lives in the apartment building in uh, the city in Eastern, um, in uh, Central Ukraine. And today she said that her um, local government decided to provide them with some wood because they plan to have these fires and bonfires in the yards uh, uh, near her uh, apartment building in case they have no uh, electricity and no heat for a couple of days. And we should be aware that um, these problems like are increasing as well. Thank you. Um, other students, <clears throat> what do you want us to know that hasn't been reported that you think we a piece of information that we wouldn't know from the news? Can I add? Mm -hmm. mm, I wanted to say that my father, now he is a combat officer and he's teaching soldiers and uh, all the stuff about weapons. And um, when he came home like two or three weeks ago, he had like five days off and he could come home and he did and when he was just talking about the stuff he saw and the things he experienced and you know my father has like this character that he disappointed but when I was talking to him and when I saw that he was just shaking his head and he was speechless and I saw tears in his eyes it was heartbreaking because he heard all the explosions and it's so horrifying and disappointing because uh, people are losing their lives just because they are Ukrainians, just because they want to live the best life and because they uh, they want to be free. They have freedom of speech and it, this just needs to stop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anastasia. Also, uh, if Diana, I could add something, me. yes. Uh, so, um, I guess that news channels um, show um, to the audience, so to say, only numbers. And uh, uh, I mean, how much uh, Ukrainian territory was occupied and uh, liberated, how uh, the number of casualties or um, how many people uh, are captured and so on. But uh, like telling only the numbers, um, doesn't um, let the audience to feel uh, feel how devastating and heartbreaking it is. Uh, so uh, we should uh, bear uh, bear in mind that 
behind those numbers are people. For example, there were photos photos of um, a man who uh, held his wife's dead wife's hand because she was uh, killed. For example, a small girl uh, whose face is all in tears because uh, her father was uh, killed while uh, defending his country, his daughter, and. Um, while fighting for the freedom uh, uh, for um, of uh, his family, and um, there are actually um, thousands of such stories, and um, uh, we um, we mustn't let uh, like that number uh, increase. So uh, we should remember that there are children uh, who will never turn ten. The students who will never get their uh, diplomas, the brides and grooms that um, like will never go down the aisle. And um, I guess that um, it shouldn't be omitted or considered as inappropriate content on TV, mm -hmm. because what is really uh, inappropriate is to keep silent about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tatiana. <clears throat> Also, I would like to add that uh, if to compare our armies, I must say that unfortunately, uh, war is always about the death. And I must say that a lot of, like uh, on the east and the south Ukraine, the blossom of our country is dying. And uh, when on the other hand, they do not like look what to mobilize, yeah? So they don't care if they were fighting uh, in any army before or they know what is army. They just take the people just to make it as a as meat, I would say, I don't know, or something like that, just to to wash some points. So it's completely different different because unfortunately, uh, a lot of people uh, I know that uh, already dead. Uh, they were like just like the best sons of Ukraine, and uh, I cannot say the same about the Russian uh, warriors, unfortunately. Thank you, Maxime. <clears throat> um, we're going to now go to the um, questions that have are coming in in the chat. We'll take about five or uh, ten minutes for that. <clears throat> um, so the first question: um, Has this war influenced your study plans in any way? So, for example, have you enrolled in classes that you felt were particularly relevant to what's going on now, or maybe even changed your major because of what's going on. So has the war, or how has the war influenced your study plans? <clears throat> so may I start with that? Mm -hmm. So first of all, if you talk about studying, uh, you see that like, even right now there is three alarm uh, alerts right now, like the so air alerts, uh, and you understand that during the hour like studying, it's impossible to have studying when it is air alert because a lot of uh, students are from the eastern Ukraine, probably the center of the, the middle of the Ukraine, and uh, something like that. So it's difficult because some of them should go to the shelter, like we all should go to the shelter, but still and it's impossible to have like some of the kind of lessons. Also, uh, it's really awful when during the lesson it appears because like it's in the middle of the studying uh, we have to move away. And I don't know if to compare even like I have got a younger brother and he's like in the kindergarten and sometimes what is the shelter, I'm really sorry that such like little kids know what is war and uh, there is no way out of here, so, but uh, that's cool because like they know the real enemy like because I don't think it will change for a long time unfortunately but uh, it affected like the from the little kids up to the students and I think even uh, the professors and teachers like uh, all over Ukraine so that's what I wanted to say about that mm -hmm. thank you others I also would like to say that I plan to this year to study in Austria the, the economics in order uh, for me to bring this experience back to Ukraine and implement this in practice. However, because of uh, Russia's invasion, uh, my plans had to be put off. And now 
I'm changing my plans. I'm planning to study in another direction and uh, perhaps in the future when the borders uh, uh, are open, I will be able to finally um, chase my dreams and to uh, get what I always uh, wanted and what I always uh, was striving for. And what's that, Tamina? Uh, that was, uh, to, I always wanted to study uh, economics and politics uh, to improve the situation in our country, to make our Ukraine even a better place, as uh, obviously we have problems. Yeah, that's obvious. Every country has problems, but this is why we need to encourage our youth to, to uh, gain experience from other countries, to learn from them, and then to accumulate this experience and use it to benefit uh, uh, for our country. And this is why it's uh, really important that we uh, combat Russia, we defeat uh, this uh, tyrannical state, and then we, uh, we are moving forward uh, towards a successful and uh, towards uh, a promising future. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Um, how has the war affected your study plans? Are you have you changed majors? Are you uh, departments? Are you studying a, a particular course because you think it's relevant? <clears throat> okay. Um, another question is, um, how can we at FIU support you the most? <clears throat> how do you think we can support you? We who are on this call and others who couldn't be on the call, how, what concrete things can we do to support you? <clears throat> May I please? Mm -hmm. So you can help us to spread information about Ukraine on social media because it's important to show the world truth about what's going on and to fight together against the dictatorship, injustice and violence. Everywhere in Ukraine, you have a chance to get under fire because Russian army shoots mainly civil objects. It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity and breaking the rules of war, which Russia repeats every single day. So you it can be our voice to convey information to the masses and international organization, organizations. Thank you. We will. We will. Thank you. <clears throat> I also like to add that. Uh, I believe that I know that some people in the U.S. Uh, uh, think that Ukraine rips uh, them off of their money and their weapons. I totally understand that. And I know that we are asking a lot from you, uh, but I, um, I'm uh, asking you to send more weapons, to send uh, more financial support to Ukraine. And I totally understand some people that feel like they're pouring money into Ukraine for no reason, that it's not their war, it's ours. But in fact, it's a war that is uh, about uh, democracy and totalism, and it's about uh, values versus oppression. So uh, it concerns the whole world, which is why this victory is so crucial for the future progress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And I also want to add, so of course, uh, my life has changed. As I said, uh, the feeling of fear and uh, hatred does not leave me. My mental state is terrible. This is the worst year of my life. But on the other hand, I'm very glad that I have a roof over my head, water and food, because um, 
and many people do not have a home and I feel so sorry for such people. I also, I always try to send them money to help in any way I can. For example, I have a friend who lives in with her family in Zaporizhia. Russians bombed the neighboring house and many people died, unfortunately. They are very afraid of their lives. Now I help them find apartments in my city hope this uh, all ends soon thank you thank you Nora. i also wanted to say that uh, besides spreading the information you can uh we can say that uh, your help matters your voices matter and your money that you send matter because for example my mom is working at the kindergarten and uh, now it isn't working properly there are no kids there are internally displaced people i as far as i remember there are like 90 of them and uh, she every day she says that the help and the food that uh, other countries are, are getting us and the food that they're getting is really is extremely important and it helps them a lot to save their money and save the money of the people that just flew their homes and uh, fleed from that horrible war and i really just want to th thank you for this meeting to sp really spread the awareness and spread everything that we experience in real life to the people that the people that really want to hear that and want to be a part of the of this situation, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it, that that's really very important for us to know, Vasio, that 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 our help is is getting to where it needs to be. So thank you for that. <clears throat> um, as the last um, the last thing we're going to do together today, and as Dr. Bonnick says, this is not the this is not the end. This is the beginning of our collaboration. Is we'd like to um, we'd like to learn a little bit of Ukrainian. So well, I'm going to go around, and if you can give us one word, each of you one word or phrase um, that you you want us to know either in English or Ukrainian, actually, but be great if it were <laughs> Ukrainian, but one word you'd like to end with. Um, and we'll start with you, Dr. Petrenko. <laughs> okay. Ну, саме відомо це слава Україні. І на сьогоднішній день військовий час ми використовуємо «Укрзалізниця», «Паляниця» і «Полуниця». Для того, щоб визначити, хто є росіянин, а хто українець. Так що вчимо паляниця, укрзалізниця. Maybe somebody else. Okay? Okay, that was, a, that was one long phrase. And we have a Margazata, maybe you got that. It's a Margazata, ви зрозуміли? Uh, so Dr. Petrenko says that uh, there is a word that distinguishes Ukrainians from Russians because only Ukrainians can pronounce it um, properly. Palyanetsya, palyanetsya. So this is the this this is the code word uh, word which is really helpful in the trenches where uh, even Russian speaking uh, soldiers that that uh, during the the dark hours when they can protect themselves because they know if if they are allies are approaching or 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 Russians are approaching and are going to kill them. So even Russian speaking soldiers are using those words like Palanitsa or Zaliznitsa, which is the railway in, in Ukrainian, um to 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 recognize the, themselves and their allies. Thank you. <clears throat> Maxime, one word or phrase you want to leave us with? It's very difficult to pronounce some words you see and some so, uh, sounds. <laughs> Basically, if you talk about me, I would say like three typical greetings. One of them, I'm sure you know, it's like Slava Ukraini, Heroim Slava. Yeah, glory to Ukraine, glory, glory to heroes. We also have God, Slava, Nazi, Smart, Vorham. So glory to the nation and death to the enemies. And the last one, Ukraina. So Ukraine overall. 
something like that. So this one is like, I, I think the most important you to know, like how to greet Ukrainians anywhere. Thank you, Maxine. Anura. Yes, I want to tell you about a verb, kochati. It's a verb, namely about, um, and namely in a romantic way. Kochati. Okay, Kohati. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Pavzo. <clears throat> well, I think there is just one word that I want to uh, say is Paramoha, is victory. This is just what we're going to face soon, and I know that we're going to be victorious in this war. So, Paramoha. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to teach you an expression which means love your motherland. Lubit uh, Batkivshino. Thank you. Uh, Anastasia. Yes, uh, I wanted to share the phrase Sebude Ukraina because Ukraine will win, Ukraine is fighting, and there will be peace and Ukraine will be developing, so Sebude Ukraina. Thank you. And Dr. Sorochan. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, share a bit of a meme phrase if you if you ask me. It would be Bavovna. You know, uh, there is a short story when Ukrainian uh, Ukra Ukraine decided to fight back Russia, so we started bombing uh, Russian territory in uh, Belhorod, for example. Uh, but Russia uh, has... Uh, you know, you know, a censorship in their uh, TV, so they could not could not speak about explosions or some kind of attacks. So instead of that, they uh, used to say claps, like you know, so sound of clapping. And uh, after that, some of Russians decided to go to Ukraine undercover using Google Translate in uh, in Ukrainian language, and they say that there have been bavolna in the region. But uh, bavolna is the Ukrainian word for cotton. And uh, but in Russian it would be the same as for clap, chlopok. So in this case, this meme was born, and every time we are referring to explosions or attacks in Russia, like in in Belhorod or Kursk or somewhere, we are saying that Bavona is happened there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tatiana. Uh, so it's a phrase that um, is very meaningful for us. Um, and um, uh, it's a quote of Taras Shevchenko. Probably you have heard about um, this uh, world uh, famous author. And uh, it means like battle on and you will win your battle. Keep fighting. So it's the phrase. Thank you. And Vasil. I would like to share the phrase that helps me keep strong. It actually this is uh, the phrase "stay strong." Yeah. It's something that we should to recall to ourselves every day when we wake up and go to bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and um, Dr. Uh, Bialik, you've got the last word here. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Landa. And I think that when the students and all the participants spoke about uh, help for Ukraine or something like that, so it means that Ukraine is not poor. It does not mean that Ukraine is poor. It is robbed, but it is not poor. It has fast, and I think that you, American students should know about that, that it has many first in industry and in the agriculture. We cannot speak about our black soil. We cannot speak about our industrial uh, enterprises and so on. So that's why we do believe, we still believe, so there was such a thong, you see, so. And we do believe that the Ukraine will exist. The Ukraine will flourish, the Ukraine, but it will be together with our common efforts of all the world. Of all the world. So I suppose so Sebu de Ukraina, as Nasty, so she see mentioned this thing, it seems to me. You see, so Sebu de Ukraina. Ukraine will be. So 
Thank you very much. So uh, really, it was exciting to see meeting this year, by the way. And uh, Marujata. <laughs> Dziękujemy wam za waszą uczast u Cipodi, za te, co wy znajdźli osoby siły, żeby nam rozpowiedzieć pro swój osobisty dosyt. Wielka wdzięczność wam za waszą szczerość, ta mużność, za te, co wy nie zdajecie się, że trzymajecie się jeden odnogo ta swoich czynności, ta nagadujecie nam, że ta wina nie stosuje się tylko do Ukrainy. Wierte w sebe, w swoich odnodumców i w swoją krainę. Palanica. Dziękuję. Thank you all and <clears throat> until the next time, please stay safe and know that we're with you. Because many, many students were willing to participate, you see, but this was just a limited number. So that's why we think the next time you see, so we'll have more students, other students. Uh -huh.